Let's talk today about the ways chemical elements react with one another. This time we'll focus on chemical reactions which form a specific kind of product called an ionic compound. Let's start by picking that name apart to see what it means. First, the word compound. A compound is a chemical species made up of more than one element. For example, that table salt you put on your mashed potatoes last night is a compound between the elements sodium and chlorine. Now the word ionic indicates that the compound is made up of ions. Recall that there are two kinds of ions, positive ones called cations and negative ones called anions. Now as you know, individual atoms are normally neutral. So how does it happen that in the case of table salt, sodium atoms and chlorine atoms become charged and thus form an ionic compound? Well, let's see. We can use the periodic table to help us understand how ionic compounds form. As you recall, this table collects elements of similar chemistry together. Now we can actually group elements in different ways. For our purposes today, let's divide the elements into two major groupings, the metals and nonmetals. Metals appear on the left and lower parts of the table. Nonmetals constitute a smaller group of elements on the upper right. Now you'll notice that in making these groupings, we've ignored the column of elements on the extreme right of the table. These are called the noble gases and they serve as a guide to help predict what the metals and nonmetals will do chemically. Now what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that you can often predict how metal and nonmetal elements will react by comparing their electron configuration with that of the closest noble gas. Before we get into the details, let's address the question, why is the electron configuration important? When atoms react with one another, it's the electrons that interact. The nucleus of the atom really doesn't get involved. It's buried way down deep inside the atom. The electrons, however, are out where the action is. So how an element reacts depends on the electron configuration. And that's because chemical reactivity has to do primarily with exchanging or sharing electrons between atoms. Now it turns out that a simple way of predicting reactivity is to assume that atoms want to obtain the electron configuration of the closest noble gas element. So what's so wonderful about the noble gases? They have completely filled shells. Look for example at neon. Its atomic number is 10. Its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 it has a complete set of electrons. And the elements close by want to do the same. They want to be noble too. So, how would an element like sodium, for example, accomplish this lofty goal? Sodium is element 11 on the periodic table right after neon. Therefore, it has one more electron. Why don't you hit pause and take a minute to determine its electron configuration? Well, here it is. Now for the crux of the issue. What would sodium have to do to obtain the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas, namely neon? Clearly, it would have to give up its valence electron, wouldn't it? And if it did, it would cease to be a neutral atom. It would become a singly charged cation with this symbol. It turns out that's exactly what sodium does. Usually, when sodium reacts with another element, it gives up an electron to become a positively charged cation and attain the electron configuration of neon. Now, you'll notice that sodium is part of that large group of elements on the left of the periodic table. It's a metal. And what sodium does is typical of how metals react. They give up electrons. Now, let's take a look at another close neighbor of neon, namely fluorine. 
as we did with sodium, whenever we're trying to predict how an element will react, the first step we want to take is to look at the electron configuration of the element. Here's the electron configuration of fluorine. And just for reference, here once again is the electron configuration of neon. So, the question we ask ourselves at this point is, what would fluorine need to do to obtain the electron configuration of neon? And the obvious answer is that the fluorine atom will take on one extra electron. In doing so, it's converted from a neutral atom to a negatively charged ion, an anion. And it turns out that that's exactly how fluorine atoms normally react. They pick up an electron to form the one minus ion, and therefore obtain the electron configuration of neon. Now fluorine is a typical member of the nonmetals. In general, nonmetals wish to add electrons to obtain the electron configuration of a noble gas. Now you may have noticed that the way sodium typically reacts and the way fluorine typically reacts works to their mutual benefit. Specifically, sodium atoms typically want to give up one electron, and fluorine atoms typically want to take on one extra electron. So you can probably guess what happens when a sodium atom meets a fluorine atom. Specifically, the sodium atom passes its outermost valence electron to the fluorine atom, which uses the extra electron to fill its outermost valence shell. In the process, both atoms adopt the electron configuration of neon, and this makes them both very happy. <laughs> this whole concept of atoms reacting so as to adopt the electron configuration of the closest noble gas has a name. It's called the octet rule. The octet rule isn't really an explanation for what happens, but it is a useful tool for predicting how elements will react with one another. Now where do you suppose the name octet came from? Well, let's look once again at the electron configuration of neon, which is the configuration that both sodium and fluorine were trying to achieve. Notice that in the outermost electron shell, namely the n equals 2 level, the total number of electrons is 8. Indeed, the valence shell of most of the noble gases has eight electrons, and since this is the electron configuration which is sought by elements when they react, the rule gets its name from the number eight. You can predict the reactivity of a number of elements using the octet rule. For example, you've seen how sodium typically reacts. Well, it turns out that all the elements in the same column as sodium on the periodic table react the same way. We call this set of elements a family or group, specifically the alkali metals. By the same token, the group of elements in the column with fluorine behave the same way and are given the name halogens. As we said at the outset, compounds are formed when elements react. When an alkali metal, like sodium, reacts with a halogen, like fluorine, the ionic compound formed consists of a cation and an anion. We give such an ionic compound a name as well as a formula. The name is constituted in the following way. We write first the name of the element that provides the cation. That's sodium. Then we write the name of the element that provides the anion, but this time changing the name to end in IDE. So rather than fluorine, we write fluoride, F-L-U-O-R-I-D-E. Thus the name of the compound in this case is sodium fluoride. Let's talk about how we write the chemical formula of this compound. The chemical formula is a shorthand way of representing how many atoms of each element are in the compound. Now you've already learned that the compound really consists of one Na plus ion and one F minus ion. So you might think we'd write the formula Na plus F minus, but we don't. We leave off the charges and write simply 
NaF. And we assume that a good chemist will know that the charges are there. Now, just to see if you've got the message, what would be the name and formula of the compound formed between potassium and chlorine? Here's the answer. First the name, and then here's the formula. <coughs> potassium is an alkali metal like sodium, so it reacts to form K+. Chlorine is a halogen like fluorine, so it reacts to form the Cl- ion. Hence, potassium chloride.